My name is Irene Dupont Jr. That's spelled. Okay. My name is Irene Dupont Jr. That's spelled I R E N E E. Dupont, Dupont, D U P O N T, comma, Jr. And it's like the girl's name, Irene, which means peace, and Irene is the French equivalent of the male Irene, <clears throat> means peace. So tell me, how are you related to Crawford Greenwald? Crawford Greenwald married my older sister. Uh, my second oldest sister, I had eight older sisters, and she was number two in the lineup. Margretta DuPont married Crawford Greenwald. And how old were you when you first met Crawford Greenwald? Well, he was a <clears throat> some part of a fixture around, he was part of a fixture around the house uh, from my earliest memories, yes. He drove a Model T Ford with a hole in the roof. Uh, that was very impressive at the time. So when he started coming around, was he in college, do you imagine, or younger than that? Uh, he had met my sister <clears throat> at age 12 when they were both spending some time in Atlantic City. His mother, and Margareta and my aunt were sisters. So there was a family connection there. But uh, I, of course, was not present when she was 12 years old, but uh, I remember him, I guess, about at age four or five. Mm -hmm. and, and how many years were there between his sister Margareta and yourself? She is uh, 18 years older than I. And was Crawford the same age? Yes, I think there was 30 days difference in their age. She was 30 days older than he. <coughs> so um, you had mentioned that uh, you knew him when you were about two, would you say, or four? I, think. I would say four, four. yes. Well, he was um, very physically active. They would play hare and hounds on Saturday afternoons when work was out. <clears throat> he would come with a other group of young men that surrounded my sisters, and they would go running off on foot playing a game. Of, two would run away, leaving a, plotches of uh, torn up paper is where they'd been littering and uh, the hounds would try to find them, and they, that was, uh, they'd probably run five miles in the afternoon doing that. <coughs> um, and I, do you, um, do you know, was he through MIT at that point, or? Yes. Crawford had uh, graduated in the class of 1922 from MIT. I think he took a, uh, an additional year to get a master's degree. Uh, so he came to work for the DuPont Company in 1923. He was working as an, at an, as an engineer at the plant in Philadelphia. And uh, tell us something about his courtship with your sister. Well, Crawford, quite early in <clears throat> meeting my sister, decided he wanted to marry her. But he had a great deal of competition because there were many other DuPont Company engineers on the scene, and a young doctor, and uh, an older man who was my father's contemporary. And uh, so Crawford had to uh, develop a strategy so early on, he decided he would get Margretta aside from the group and say, Gret, will you marry me? 
And Gret would, of course, say, oh, Crawford, make non don't give me that nonsense. Forget it. Go away. And then uh, the next day, time they met, he would say, Margreta, would you marry me? And she'd say, oh, no, or some equally, put, it, put him off. And this went on for um, a good best part of a year. And uh, one day he said, Margreta, would you marry me? And Margreta said, yes. What did you say? And uh, then, then, of course, there was this, camera was cut off and we don't know what happened after that, but in Crawford's older years he used to tell that story about how he was totally surprised when she suddenly said yes. And what kind of uh, marriage did they have? Well, <clears throat> that uh, courtship uh, was about, produced about as successful a marriage as I'm sure it could happen. They were devoted to each other throughout their entire life. I'm sure there was probably no misadventures of any kind involving a third party. They, uh, they had a lot of fun. They knew, uh, knew a lot of contemporary couples of their own age, but it was, they just had a, a wonderful marriage. And uh, when my uh, sister, Margreta, came down with Alzheimer's, uh, Crawford was her nurse. And he would uh, not only take care of her 24 hours a day, 24 seven, and he would then, uh, he did the cooking. He was, uh, because uh, she just liked the way he cooked better than what a hired cook would provide. And he is, it seems to me, the quintessential Renaissance man. Can you kind of talk about his diverse interests and his um, abilities? <clears throat> well, Crawford uh, knew every, a little bit about everything. In fact, you might say he knew a great deal about everything. Uh, starting with music, he was playing the clarinet by the time he got to MIT. And then he, uh, when he, they developed a little um, ensemble, and somebody said, let's have a um, string quartet, but we have no cello. So Crawford volunteered. He studied the cello and became a quite useful member of the quartet. Uh, he loved music. He loved shows. He loved to go to the theater or uh, and. Uh, as all the new uh, television systems came on and methods of recording them, uh, he was right there with the latest equipment to capture the shows that he enjoyed most on television. He uh, figured in a, <coughs> in a uh, show that one of our cousins uh, developed and made a home movie in which uh, Crawford was the villain. I can remember the pictures of him being stripped of his clothes down to the BVDs and punished by the hero. But he loved to take, take on the, the difficult part of any event. Uh, beyond the, um, the arts, uh, he of course was very gifted in the, in the studies for which he was prepared in college. He was a chemical engineer, graduated with a master's degree, and then he, uh, uh, in the nylon program for the DuPont Company, he was one of the uh, supervisors of the technical work that preceded the uh, commercialization of nylon. He, uh, <coughs> His professor, Warren K. Lewis at MIT, would have been very proud of him because uh, Crawford invented a unit process, which is a step in the chemical engineering. And he made the machine which um, uh, carries on the reaction where adipic acid is converted to uh, 
the next step in the program. I'm having trouble with my memory. Uh, they, uh, can I wait a minute? Uh, are you ready? So Crawford invented the machine in which uh, adipic acid is ammoniated to make adiponitriol, the next step in producing nylon. And it <clears throat> was a very clever machine. There were some spinning disks, rather like phonograph records, but running very high speed on which uh, molten adipic acid was dripped onto the disk and flung off into an atmosphere of ammonia. And uh, that made, made the, uh, a very difficult step quite easy in the process. It became my job when I was working at the plant some years later to maintain the Crawford Greenwald machine, which was, it was a bear, but it, we, we kept it running and it was still making nylon in the early 50s. So he could do everything <clears throat> very well in the uh, technical department, extremely well, which was why he was chosen for this work that uh, under discussion today. Could you sort of characterize him? What type of an engineer was he, and why do you think that personality or that working what type of an engineer was Crawford? Why, well, he, he was both. He was a hands-on and he was a theoretical, both. Uh, you know, he could run an engine lathe up in his shop and he made models. He could make uh, objects that would be needed on the, on the, in the laboratory at DuPont. And he uh, also knew the theory from top to bottom. He was a good mathematician and he could, uh, so he was, he had both sides of the engineering issues covered as both theoretical and hands-on practical. He uh, had to, uh, he had to marry two disparate groups, the, the engineering side, the technical side, and theoreticians to, to get this, for instance, the B reactor going. He was, uh, what type of people manager was he? I guess the uh, best way to describe the way Crawford managed people was that everybody that ever worked for him thought he was God. He was a uh, he was fun to work with, he, he could be firm when he had to be firm, and he was quick with praise when there was any excuse to give it. So he, he you, you see him as a person who could put those two groups together, the engineers and the... I, I, I th think the reason he put those two groups together was because uh, he had this gift of being both uh, a thorough theoretical man as well as a hands-on fix-it engineer. Could, could you talk briefly, because uh, there's an there's, there was an issue when the first reactor was, was uh, the B reactor was started up with xenon poisoning. And what had happened was that uh, somebody at DuPont, perhaps Crawford, really over-engineered over the reactor. And the, the extra tubes that were available, the 500 extra tubes, allowed them to bring it up to enough mm -hmm. power level to overcome the xenon poisoning. Could you talk about, uh, at the time, and maybe since the DuPont uh, philosophy about, you know, uh, about engineering beyond, uh, beyond the norm into a, a theoretically safer, uh, Whatever you would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you're, you're asking me to talk about something where I was not present, but I did work for the DuPont Company, and in 
most of their work, they invariably over-engineered everything they did. They, for safety and for reasons of covering unforeseen difficulties, if you needed a dozen, they'd make 18, or if you needed uh, 42, they'd make 68. They were always erred on the overproduction side. Uh, I had to, uh, when I would make, I had a job of designing machinery when I first came with the, the DuPont company, and my first thing my boss said now, you're not working for airplanes anymore, you're working for the DuPont company, and make it stout. So apparently uh, this prevailed <clears throat> during the uh, design of the uh, major reactor at Hanford, and uh, in typical fashion, the DuPont Company uh, designed it with a significant margin of increase over the specified number of, uh, of fuel rods to be uh, put in the reactor. And, of course, that's what saved the day when, uh, when right after the first startup, <coughs> uh, some byproducts were produced within the reactor, which poisoned the operation, uh, caused the reactor to shut itself down. And uh, Crawford had knew enough about the, uh, the theory of how this reactor was working that he thought he knew what the trouble was, that they were making this extra byproduct, which was a poison, and he had always wondered why <clears throat> it didn't shut it down anyway. But fortunately, by uh, utilizing the additional fuel rods that were designed into the reactor because of over-design, uh, the reactor was able to start up and run s successfully uh, throughout its useful life. One thing, I heard an um, <clears throat> interview with Crawford at oh, an advanced age. talks about how proud he was of the work that he did during World War II of the building the B reactor. And then he says, well, I was even prouder of the chemical separation plant and the first application of remote mm -hmm. control. So do you have any, do you remember him talking? Uh, about <clears throat> I wish I could help on that. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm sure Jack Teep or Bill Neff could easily uh, tell you about well, that. I just wondered whether yeah. you mentioned but in his older, eight, older years, uh, you know, he was uh, invited to be a, uh, join the board of directors of the Boeing Airplane Company, which he did for the latter part of his life. And there he um, witnessed <coughs> the uh, development of the, of the, um, Help me now. What's the name? A Boeing. 747? Yeah, well, this, all right. This was the 707, 727, and then the 737 was the one, which was their first real extension into highly technical development of aerodynamics. <clears throat> and it had. They, uh, they had spent a lot of research money developing the 737. That was after the 747, as it turned out. It didn't come on into commercialization until after the 747. But he, uh, when they got to the point of what are we going to commercialize, Boeing suggested that they shelf the 737 and focus on the 747, which was the big ship, where the 737 was uh, for smaller uh, and shorter flights. The uh, Crawford said to them, now look, you spent all this money on your research. Is it any good or isn't it? You better do go for both of them. And they uh, mortgaged the farm, as they say, out there on the in the aircraft industry, and they did indeed develop both of them. Well, the 737 
was Boeing's nylon. That was the one that really made money for the Boeing company. And after the 700th copy was made, Crawford by that time had retired from the board, but they invited him to come back and celebrate the 700th copy of the 737, which was their real financial success uh, in, the com in the company. That's like the DC-3 of the Boeing line. You know, that's, that's the, the workhorse. That thing is yeah. bulletproof. It's a great jet. Thanks. You know, Southwest will back you up on that. They built the whole airline around that, yeah. that plane. So how would you sum up both uh, a risk taker but very conservative in that he was he must have had a lot of certainty yeah that. I don't think Crawford would admit that he was conservative he just wanted to be damn sure it succeeded and <laughs> which was the way he worked he, he did his homework and he d determined ahead of time whether it would work or wouldn't and if it when he decided it would work, the uh, forces of evil couldn't stop him. And that's exactly what he was working against, in, in a sense. Did he ever talk about uh, the feeling that those people had, mm -hmm. you know, doing the Manhattan Project and you know the patriotism they must have felt? Yes, that uh, Crawford, among all of the people I've known that ever worked on the project, agreed that in their minds, <clears throat> the Germans were going to drop the bomb any minute. And of course, as, as you already know, uh, he spent uh, June 6th, 1944, listening to the news to see whether the Germans were going to drop the bomb on the invaders at Normandy. They didn't. And, uh, but it, it was no question about it, the motivation behind the whole Han Hanford effort was patriotism. They uh, didn't for one moment think of whether they were going to get paid or not. It was purely a matter of this is what we've got to do to support the people that are out there fighting this war. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, uh, yes, I was a, a senior in college, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I came home to my parents' place in Delaware from Massachusetts to uh, have Thanksgiving with the family. And I took the, I think we had to work, I had to go to school that Friday following, but I cut classes so as to be with my family. And <clears throat> there was a nice gathering with my, most of my seven older sisters present and the, uh, men, some of their husbands who weren't away fighting. And uh, someone said, well, where's Crawford? And this, you realize, was the fall of 1942 and the DuPont Company had just been called upon to uh, investigate and work with the Manhattan Engineers District. And the, um, my father said something that he certainly shouldn't have, but he didn't know any better. My father said, oh, Crawford is out working on a bomb so terrible that it will end the war. And there was sort of silence. and. My sister Margreta didn't react that I could see. I wasn't looking at her, but uh, the subject wasn't discussed. So again, I came home for Christmas a few weeks later, and uh, I said, hey, Dad, uh, what about this bomb you mentioned that was so bad that it would stop the war? My father looked sort of blank. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Well, you said something at Thanksgiving. No, I did not. And I could tell by his expression that that ended the subject. So I figured maybe I had dreamt it or something. And it wasn't until after the war, of course, that the, what Crawford was doing was uh, cleared up. But apparently, I mean, your theory is that your, your sister told Crawford and Crawford told the old man, right? <laughs> well, I think you can speculate very definitely what happened. When my father made this mistake, uh, my sister Margretta heard it and told Crawford what my father had said. And uh, so Crawford said when he got back to Wilmington, he went to my father's older brother, Pierre DuPont, and uh, he, he said, Pierre, I've got a problem. He said, uh, if uh, Mr. Buss, as they called my father, has broken the uh, <clears throat> the secrecy agreement, uh, somebody ought to tell him that he shouldn't do that. And uh, I'm not going to tell my father-in-law, so maybe you're the one that ought to. And the old bigger brother had words with my father and between then and Christmas, so that by, by Christmas time, there was uh, full secrecy exerted. Debate about that, or was that just? Um... Well, that was after, uh, that was about the time I was being hired by the DuPont Company. Uh, I had worked for an aircraft engine company prior to that time, and, and so I really wasn't in a position to hear any of the strategy uh, or what, what the executive plans were doing. I was working in North Jersey somewhere and not, not, not tuned in. Well, one of the historians we've talked to in Hanford said that DuPont was the only company in Hanford's history to leave voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure that is correct. <laughs> Oh my. What he was like as a person, what was he like as a brother-in-law? Well, Crawford <clears throat> spoke with a very deep resonant voice, so you could tell who was talking a long way off. I remember <clears throat> there was a, my father has had a special kind of a pneumatically operated thermostat uh, to control the temperature of the house. Uh, this was because the house was built before the days of the usual uh, uh, Honeywell type thermostats that we're all familiar with. And it, there was, it would release a little hissing sound of air and the house got cold one day when there was a Sunday when there was a family gathering and so Crawford and I went down in the basement to look at the air pump and we traced all the pipes and we did everything to see why the house wasn't getting warm. 